All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the seventh PEDS Protein Engineering and Design webinar. My name is Roberto Chica. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Protein Engineering Design and Selection, and I will be chairing uh, this webinar. So I'll just start off by um, telling you a little bit about the journal before we move on to our presentations. So let me share my screen with you. Um, I have a slide prepared for that. OK, great. So as I mentioned, um, this webinar is organized by the Person Engineering Design and Selection Journal, which is published by Oxford University Press. And we thank them for helping us organize these webinars. Uh, PEDS is a not-for-profit journal that was founded in 1986 by and for protein engineers. We offer fast expert review of your work. And there are no publication charges uh, since last year. Uh, except for the optional open access fee. Um, we have a Twitter account, so if you're interested in knowing what's going on at the journal, you can uh, follow us here. And I'd like to announce right away the next and final webinar of this series, which will be on Wednesday, April 21st, and will feature Elizabeth Myring from the University of Waterloo. I also want to announce something that I've been talking about for the past couple of, of uh, webinars, which is a special collection of articles that we call Hot Topics in Protein Engineering Design and Evolution, uh, of which the first two articles are now uh, available to read for free on the PEDS website. So these are a series of review articles on uh, interesting topics uh, related to protein engineering. And there's going to be, um, there should be about 15 of them coming out in the next uh, couple of months as they get accepted. So uh, I'd like to uh, tell you about the first two that are, have been published. The first one has to do with the design and engineering of artificial metalloproteins, written by the group of Kathleen Zimmer. And the second one is uh, has to do with thermodynamics and measurements of protein stability, written by the group of Kristen Lindorf Larsen. So those two are readily available on the PES website, and you can read them for free if you're interested. OK, so um, before I introduce our, our speakers, I'll, I'd just like to remind you how um, the webinar works. So we have two presentations, a short one of about 20 minutes, followed by a question period. And then the, we'll have our keynote presentation of about 40 minutes, followed by a second question period. I will ask you. Uh, to ask your questions to the speakers using the Ask a Question button that's at the middle bottom part of your screen. And you can type your question there at any time during uh, the webinar. And the, uh, the presenter will uh, make sure that they answer it during the question period. OK, so without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Nelina Valapin from the Los Alamos National Lab. So she is uh, from India, where she obtained her Bachelor of Science in Agriculture at the Kerala Agricultural University. And from there, she moved to the US, uh, specifically in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, where she worked in a variety of, of research labs before starting her master's degree at the University of New Mexico. Um, and there she worked with um, her advisors, Dr. Babera Marone and Dr. John Omdahl. And since 2000, she's been a research technologist in the biosciences division at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And um, uh, in her work, she um, develops new antibodies using phage and yeast display. And um, today she will tell us about her editor's choice article that was recently published in PEDS, which is a collaboration between the groups of uh, Andrew Bradbury and uh, Jeffrey Waldo. So it combines really the engineering of fluorescent, sorry, of uh, antibodies with fluorescent proteins. And the title of this article is Construction, Characterization, and Crystal Structure of a Fluorescent Single Chain FV Chimera. So please, uh, Nelina, take it away. Thank you very much, Roberto, for that lovely introduction and choosing our article. Let me make sure that um, share screen. Oh, 
once again, um, thank you to Dr. Roberto Chica for selecting our article as his editor choice for this webinar, and Sarah McKenna from Oxford Press for um, organizing this event. I also want to thank um, each and every one of you for your time and joining me on this talk. My co-authors and I would like to present the methodologies we used in construction catalyzation of a fluorescent single chain chimera, and we will also include the crystal structure of one such protein. Antibodies are one of the most well-known um, molecules of our immune system. You all probably heard about antibody-based therapies for COVID-19, as well as antibody-based diagnostic systems. Um, fluorescent antibodies are one of the most ubiquitous reagents in biomedical sciences research. I've um, shown a couple of applications for this. One is flow cytometry, the other one is fluorescent microscopy-based immunohistochemistry. Our group uh, works with uh, the IgG, a subclass of antibodies. In this Y-shaped molecule, the tip of the molecule is the antigen recognition part of this protein. Um, and since I mentioned fluorescent IgGs, the, one of the best ways to fluorescent make fluorescent IgGs is by chemical conjugation. Here, the reactive group on the fluorophore is, um, uh, reacts with the lysine, which is one of the amino acids on the um, antibody and reacts with the primary amine and forms an amide and links the fluorophore covalently to the IgG. Um, however, this, this can cause some problems because if there are lysines in the binding region, it will hinder uh, antigen recognition. If there are multiple lysines, and there are usually multiple lysines on the antibody, and this will create um, labeling in different parts of the antibody, and it will also be different lysines and different antibody molecules, and gives an heterogeneity in labeling. If there are too many fluorophores on a given antibody, it actually uh, causes quenching, and it will be a dimmer antibody molecule. And there will also all this together will cause batch to batch variations. And before we can actually label an antibody, what you need to do is find an antibody that recognizes your specific target. Um, our group has been focused on antibody engineering and development for some years. And we, along with everybody else in, the world, in our field, worked on COVID-19 antibodies in the last year. Um, our uh, display technology used FH display and yeast display combination. And instead of using the entire IgG for um, display, we just use the SAF ring, uh, which is just the tip, which is the, just the binding moiety. And um, so the, the library selection occurs in the FH display library, followed by yeast display and flow cytometry starting. At the end, you get DNA sequences and you can clone in the gene to a soluble antibody format. Um, as I mentioned previously, the SEFV, we start with SEFV, and if you end up with SEFV, there are some issues. Um, these are, you know, a part of a small molecule, so they have a tendency to aggregate. The expression level in E. coli is lower, and all these things together makes problems for uh, uh, purification and long-term storage. And one, even if you survive all these issues, you still need a secondary antibody for detection. We, along with others, have tried to improve the performance of IgG in multiple ways. You can either convert them back into the IgG molecule or do an SEFVFC. Both of these require improve the stability of the molecule. However, as we discussed previously, they need some sort of a labeling to detect their binding. The other method is using a single chain fluorescent chimeras. And there are two ways of making these SEFPs, either put the fluorescent protein on the C-terminus of the antibody moiety or use this fluorescent protein as a linker. So in our work, we use thermal green protein or TGP as a linker between the VL and VH region of the SEF ring. The TGP was engineered in our laboratory and uh, based on crystal structures in the study we did, it, we know that this is an extremely stable, highly soluble, non-aggregating and monomeric protein. And we hypothesized that um, this protein would be a very suitable um, fluorescent protein to try the SEFP format. 
Um, here is how we clone in um, the SEFPs, uh, usually, usually using an inverse um, PCR to amplify the VHVL and the SEFP plasmid, followed by um, also a PCR amplification of the TGP, and you bring together the molecule using a CPEC assembly. And we did this construction both in the yeast display vectors as well as the protein expression vector system. So the first two antibodies that we um, tested this um, method is used for uh, two antibodies that we selected against FC epsilon R1 receptor of the LFG pathway. The standard method of detecting antibodies is by using an expression tag. In our vector system, we use anti-SV5 antibody labeled with phycoerythrin to detect the expression system. And um, as you can see, um, all these molecules shift to the right to show expression and the y-axis is the binding and the shift upward shows the y-axis. The subgroup of yeast that does not display or bind shows is the negative control. Um, so both um, the antibodies as SCTGPs displayed on yeast and bound the antigen and the amount of binding signal you get depends upon the sequence of the antibody. In the lower panel, what you see is detecting the expression using just the fluorescence. The SEFEs do not fluoresce, so they only show the binding signal, whereas the SETGP, because they have a green fluorescence, shift in both directions to have the signal in the fourth quadrant. Um, this is this table shows the numerical value for the dot plots that I showed you before. And what uh, the data shows is that the yeast can display both the SDFE and the SETGP. And the binding is quite specific. This is the negative control uh, value with the negative control antigen. And this is the specific binding. And as you can see, there is almost a nine times difference between the specific signal. And another part of the exciting result was at the, though the display level and the signal, the actual signal level is low, the affinity of both kind of um, antibody formats is pretty close. It's about 3x range. So in conclusion, we found that we added a very nice uh, feature to the antibody, the fluorescence, and, and retained all the functionality that it needs to have. In this um, set of experiments, I switched the expression from um, per, uh, yeast to E. coli. Single chains are expressed in periplasm and fluorescent proteins are expressed in cytoplasm. So we tried for SETGPs both a periplasmic expression as well as a cytoplasmic expression. And as you can see, SETGPs are nice fluorescent and you can see where um, the protein is expressed and purified. And um, I wanted to bring your attention to this graph where it shows that there's a statistically difference, significant difference between the periplasmic expression in orange and the cytoplasmic expression in green. And the one step FLISA data shows that that is um, the proteins that is expressed in cytoplasm actually functions better as well. So we concluded that we will be choosing cytoplasmic expression for SETTPs from now on. The data I showed you before was um, done with um, binding assays were done with crude extracts. And here I am showing you protein ex purification and the quantity of um, pure, uh, protein obtained. For single chains that are quite well expressed, SETTP still improved the expression level. And if you have problem single chains, which so the anti-tyrosine sulfate single chain is a has aggregation issues and converting them to SCTGP actually rescues the single chain and in terms of stability as well as yield. Um, the antibodies themselves are described in some of our other publications. Um, here is some more binding data that combine, combines the SCFE and SCTGP. Um, the comparison is done with equal concentration or at equal amount, as well as at EQ molar concentration. And um, there are two kinds of assay that I'm showing you here, an ELISA data as well as a FLISA data. Um, in ELISA data, you can compare the SEFE and the SETGP directly, and um, they function similarly. In the FLISA data, SEFEs do not have fluorescence, so only the SETGPs function, but it shows that SETGPs can be detected in one-step assay. 
Um, next exciting result we obtained was the crystal structure. The crystal structure from a bipyramid shaped crystals at 2.5 angstrom showed that the VL and VH region of the antibody is linked by the fluorescent protein PGP. The, this slide shows an application for SEPGP. And you know, to set the context, let me explain um, the story. Uh, a concurrent project that we had in the laboratory was selecting antibodies against uh, Ypastis. Ypastis is a causative agent of uh, plague. And we were working with F1 protein, which at that moment purified protein is a dimeric protein. And we had a total of eight different antibodies um, against the F1 protein. And we wanted to bring down the number to a few with important characteristics. And epitope binning is a key um, property for antibodies because if you can find antibodies that recognize different parts of the protein or different epitopes of the protein, you can, um, they're much better for diagnostic as well as um, therapeutic application. So here is the schematic diagram for the assay format. Here the F1 protein is uh, coated on a micro well plate and you add the SATGPs. To this complex, you add the non-labeled IgG. So if the IgG binds the same epitope as the F1, the IgG, because it has two binding moieties, will replace the SATGP and there will be a lowering of fluorescence. However, if the IgG binds at a different epitope or a different part of the protein, the fluorescence will remain the same. We set up the assay at the half saturation binding concentration, which is around 5,000 nanogram for SATGP2 shown in this graph. So here is the actual epitope binning data. So this particular assay is done with SATGP2 and the three IgGs used are two, three, and eight. And you can see that the three and eight, uh, the fluorescence is high up here, meaning roughly the same fluorescence, and they recognize a different epitope than the SATGP2. The YP2, which shares the uh, same epitope of SATGP2. There's a um, reduction in fluorescence showing that, um, yes, the assay is working and um, the concept is working very well. Um, here is another competition assay between SATGP8 and I YP3 and YP8 IgGs. Uh, we were trying to figure out if the 3 and 8 had different epitopes. However, what we see is a drop in fluorescence showing, telling us that 3 and 8 has the same epitope. So in conclusion, I've shown you that ACTGPs are a very um, useful molecule in protein engineering and antibody uh, assays. Uh, you can convert your favorite anti SEFV or your antibody into the ACTGP format using simple cloning techniques. Straightforward assessment of protein expression and purification is possible due to um, the fluorescence. I've shown you data that the effective is displayed for SATGP and comparable functioning in respect to SEFE and comparable affinity. The fluorescence also allows one-step binding assay, both as a purified protein as well as on the yeast. Cytoplasmic expression is the best um, for SATGPs where you can get high levels of proteins and as well as you can probably rescue some of the proteins that has um, expression issues. So here I have um, presented a unique antibody format with a variety of uses in research, such as um, signal transduction um, research, as well as host pathogen interaction studies, and in clinical settings where um, fluorescence is can be used as a diagnostic method. The work here was conducted under um, Dr. Andrew Bradbury's guidance while he was at LANO and it, by members of our lab, as well as our collaborators. Um, the crystallographers on the team um, are um, Devin, Leeway, Natasha, and um, Jeff. Um, Devin is the one who actually started the project and initiated the idea. Leslie, Colin, and Donna were um, members of the Bradbury team who did a lot of the binding assays with me. Antonieta and I worked on the YPASTIS project together. I would also like to thank the Funding institutions, National Institutes of Health, Foundations of National Institute of Health, um, DOE COVID um, Care Project, as well as um, LANL LDR DTR. And thank you all for your attention.
Great. Thank you, Nelina, for the very nice presentation. I think you have already a question uh, for you. Um, you yes. Um, so the linkers are, um, I think, about 20 amino acids uh, between the, the two proteins. I have to um, 100% sure. Any other questions? Yes, I think you had a few questions in there. Oh. They want to know, are they glycine serine link linkers? And also, have you thought about making a tandem SCFV with fluorescent proteins conjugated? Um, there, it, there is, yes, there, it is glycine linker, uh, glycine serine linker based linker. Um, and the second question was, um, have I tried different fluorescent proteins? I can't see the question. It's part of the same uh, paragraph. There are three questions. Oh. If you can ask a question, the final sentence has to do with. Oh, uh, uh, have you thought about making tandem single chains with fluorescent proteins conjugated? Um, so, yes, we have tried it, and it's not very easy to express and purify. The expression level is pretty low. So, the SCPGB format like works much better. And I have a question as well. Uh, so you, you use this very stable and uh, soluble GFP for your project. Is this because you had tried others before and you, there was an issue, or you just figured you know we might as well go with the the most stable and soluble one that we have? Um, so as TGP is was engineered in our laboratory, and so it's easy to work with it. There was no licensing issues and stuff like that. And since it's engineered in our lab, we wanted to to show its properties and its uses. So that's what we started with. I have tried um, superfolder GFP in the same format as well, as well as superfolder Cherry. So um, it does work in other formats. Okay, interesting. And you have another question that popped in. Is the limitation to the production and yield of antibodies? Um, if it is denaturation or aggregation, we have possible solution using special types of soft nanopores we developed. Um, well, the first limitation for um, SEFE expression is the actual expression level. The antibodies are human proteins, and hence they are sort of poisonous to E. coli. And the expression is also in 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 periplasm. So together, it creates just the lower expression level, and lower expression level creates problems for purification and all that thing. So. Um, and the SCTGPs, the major um, importance is that they can be expressed in cytoplasm, so the expression level really goes up. But thank you for the uh, um, nice idea for the um, nanopores. It's, it, nanopores are bringing quite a big thing these days. OK, great. So uh, please join me again in thanking our speaker for the nice presentation. Thank you, Nalina. Thank you. OK, so without further ado, I'll introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. David Baker from the University of Washington. Uh, in many ways, I feel like I don't have to introduce uh, our next speaker. I think most of us uh, know of him and his uh, amazing work. Uh, nevertheless, I've prepared a few uh, notes here just to keep it brief. OK, so Dr. Baker earned his bachelor's degree in biology from Harvard University. And from there, he moved to UC Berkeley. Uh, to work with Randy Sheckman on pr uh, studying protein transport and trafficking in yeast. And uh, there he obtained his PhD in biochemistry. After that, he moved across the, the bay to um, UC San Francisco to work with David Agard, uh, focusing on structural biology and protein folding for his postdoctoral fellowship. And in 1993, he started his own lab at the University of Washington. And since then, I think, uh, as you'll see from the presentation, no doubt, there's been a lot of really impressive and um, groundbreaking work coming out of, of the lab. And um, I think many of us, if not most of us, have been influenced or affected by the, the work uh, that Dr. Baker is doing in his lab. In particular, as you know, he has uh, developed the Rosetta protein design software that many people around the world are using. And he's pioneered a lot of um, protein design um, um, 
examples such as you know the novel design of enzymes the first design of a uh, fold not observed in nature also now you know making um, new structures that can have many different functions from binding to switching and um, I think uh, you know it's a great pleasure to to have him here at tell us about his work and I haven't mentioned all the awards and successes because there's too many of them, uh, but it's definitely a pleasure to have uh, David with us. And uh, I look forward to your presentation. Thank you for joining us. Well, th thanks, Roberto. Um, let's see. Um, I just, uh, yeah, let me, let me just try sharing my screen here. And uh, here we go. Um, let's see. I am screen. Can you share? What do you see? Um, uh, do, we, we see the, the Crowdcast window. You see the Crowdcast window. So I guess the sharing didn't work. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll go back to that. Um, so uh, let's see. So I might, I, I, um, I'm not sure why that's happening. Um, uh, how do I get the the Chrome window. So it, if you click on the the laptop uh, symbol and you select, um, you know, application, you'll be able to pick uh, PowerPoint or or whatever software yeah, you're using. Let me try it one more time because I thought I did that. I picked, oh, should I pick application window or Chrome, yes. win Chrome application window? Yes. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I picked Chrome tab and that was wrong. I don't think it worked. Oh. Uh, that's really strange. I'm sorry. I'm picking, I pick application window and then I share, um, share. Oh no, <laughs> sorry. I, this worked just a moment ago. For some reason it's not letting me share. I don't know why that is. Um, uh, any, any suggestions? So I can click the share box and mm -hmm. so I click share screen then I pick application window, mm -hmm. and I the Chrome tab, and then I and see, then, and then I the share. Window, can, can, do you see your PowerPoint? I, I do see it. I see the, I see the Google, I see the, the app, the Chrome window. And then if I hit share, it for some reason doesn't share. Um, David, if you try just sharing your whole screen again, I can maybe talk you through how to get the, the PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm going to click share screen. Yeah. Yeah. Then. So at the minute, it's not opening anything. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if I shouldn't just quit and rejoin. Maybe there's something funny maybe, with yeah. the browser. Yeah, <laughs> if you if you log out, and we'll, we'll add you back in in just a second. Bear with us. Okay, I'm really while. sorry about this, everybody. No, don't be sorry at all. Thanks, David. Okay, please uh, bear with us while we deal with these technical issues. I promise it'll be well worth the wait. Oh, and Sarah, I'd just like to mention that um, we have 251 people registered. So I hope this is not going to prevent David from coming back. So, okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to try again. Share screen, application window, um, or maybe I'll try Chrome tab, um, Google Slides, share. Did that work? Oh, something's happening. Yeah, it works. Okay, sorry, really sorry about that. I, I don't know why that happened. My computer does strange things. Okay, well, it's um, thanks again, for Roberto, for um, inviting me at, to give this presentation here and uh, and for the very nice introduction. And um, I remember it was, it was great the, the year you came to RosettaCon. Um, and uh, so it's also very nice to give this talk to people who have an interest in protein design and engineering. Usually I have to start by justifying why anyone would possibly care about it, but I probably don't have to do that here. 
So the picture that has, has sort of driven our um, work on protein design up until very recently is shown here. Um, so in this picture, uh, it's based on the idea that proteins fold to their lowest free energy states. So in that case, if you want to predict the structure for a protein, you have to search through the different possible uh, uh, states of the protein, conformations of the protein for the one that has lowest energy. And if you want to design a protein which folds to a new structure, you first decide on what that structure is, and then you have to find a sequence whose lowest energy state is that structure. And the, the, um, over the years, we've developed, um, and our colleagues really around the world, um, have developed this program called Rosetta, which um, does the searching through the different possible structures, the searching through different possible sequences, and um, evaluates energies. And the, the energy function has gotten more accurate over the years, so that's enabled um, uh, you know, everyone who's using Rosetta to do, um, to make um, better and better and more complicated designs. So this is a physically based picture um, because we're with a protein chain, it's folding up and uh, um, all these, you know, we're calculating, we're the, in the energy function, we're looking at hydrogen bonding, van der Waals interaction, solvation and so forth. So the, towards the end of my talk, I'll switch to describing sort of a different picture, which is a, a deep learning based picture, which is really based on recognizing inherent relationships just between sequence and structures that, that don't really have to do with, um, or not directly related to a particular physical model. And what I'm gonna focus on today is um, de novo protein design. And as you're, as you're all aware, the number of possible sequences that a 100 residue protein can have is, is really astronomical because you can have 20 amino acids in any positions, so the combinatorics get really, really huge. So if we think of all of sequence space rec uh, represented by this gray rectangle, uh, the, um, it's really, really huge. And the naturally occurring proteins in these red uh, box, red ovals, these are families, these naturally occurring sequences tend to clump together, are really a tiny, tiny fraction of this. So there's this huge space of sequences which haven't been explored by, um, by natural evolution. And so everything I'm going to tell you about today is designing proteins completely from scratch. And so none of the proteins will be, um, uh, will be have any sequence relationship to proteins of known structure. And I'm going to begin by, um, by uh, sort of introducing um, sort of de novo protein design in the context of what we've been doing um, against COVID-19. So after the genome sequence was published, um, we first built models of using Rosetta of the spike glycoprotein um, and then later switched to using the cryo-EM structure and the crystal structure as those became uh, um, available. And we've been working on antivirals, diagnostics, and vaccines, and they illustrate different aspects of de novo protein design. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of highlight that as I go through. So um, in terms of antivirals, we've been focusing on designing proteins which block the interaction between the spike protein and the um, ACE2 receptor. Um, and we took two approaches. One approach was to take the alpha, uh, the alpha helix that's at the, the, the forms the major part of the interface between ACE2 and the receptor binding domain of the virus and build small proteins around it, as you see here. In the second approach, we, um, uh, we um, uh, built uh, in silico library, very large in silico libraries of small um, proteins, and then basically dock them against the receptor binding domain and then design the interface uh, to identify the most shape complementary matches and then design the interface for high affinity binding. Um, and here are uh, pictures of these two proteins, uh, two of these proteins here. So the one on the right is, uh, the, is one of the, the best candidates we've made using this completely de novo approach. And you can see um, that it's very shape complementary to, um, to the receptor binding domain of the spike. Um, and this is the one that we built where we built around the ACE2 helix. And I'll be coming back to both of these proteins in a bit. So this one is, this one's only 55 amino acids. It, um, its melting temperature is, it basically doesn't melt. Um, uh, now here is the structure of that protein. Um, so, okay, so that everything was so far now was just a computer, so far it was just a computer model. We made synthetic genes encoding many designs, identified those which bound the best and, um, uh, this is now a cryo-EM structure of the one I just showed you on the right, which was on the right, which is one of our best candidates. And here you can see the three um, 
the three little 55 residue proteins binding to the huge spike trimer, which is in the surface view back here. And um, what's really kind of neat from the computational design point of view is that if you superimpose the experimentally determined structure here, just taking each of the, taking the RBD and the, the binding domain, and now superimpose that on our Rosetta computational model, you can see that the binding domain is basically in exactly the same place. And um, so that not only do we get the structure of this brand new protein right, but exactly how it binds to the viral protein. And um, if you look at the details, even the side chain details are in the right place. So, um, so this de novo protein design can be pretty accurate. So if you take that protein and add it to cells that have been infected with the virus or, or are in the presence of the virus, um, basically what happens is uh, you block infection. And you don't need to add very much. So this is the protein I just showed you about, the one in magenta here, the, the line. And you can see by the time we're at about 20 picomolar, um, the, uh, we are blocking most of the, um, uh, of, of the cell infection. So these proteins are very potent inhibitors of the virus. Um, they, as you know, the mechanism just that they bind to this, to the spike protein and prevent it from interacting with ACE2. Um, so, um, uh, uh, this is a, an animal, uh, a, a hamster experiment, um, in collaboration with Dan Baruch's lab. Um, and here, if they, if hamsters um, that are infected with the virus get very, very sick, they lose a lot of weight. But if you take this protein and you just give it intranasally um, from 48 hours before all the way through to 24 hours afterwards, um, there is um, really no, uh, they really barely get sick at all. Um, and um, uh, so, so this, this uh, protein can protect uh, animals from, um, both prophylactically and therapeutically from the virus. Uh, so now we have these three small do binding domains, 55 residues binding to three RBDs on the spike trimer, and we can make still higher avidity versions by linking them together. So this is data from Andrew Hunt um, at uh, Northwestern. So this just shows that if we, if we link these domains together, bind those constructs to the virus, and then measure the amount of protein associated with the virus over time, what we see is that um, there is um, essentially no dissociation after 14 days. So these multivalent proteins, which are still very small, bind, bind with essentially, essentially irreversibly to the virus. Um, so these, these uh, multi-chain ver versions, so here's one where we have a, a trimerized version of, of one of the binders, and here's one where we have the three binders linked by short linkers three different binding domains linked by short linkers. And you can see these are very uh, potently um, uh, um, uh, neutralizing um, the, uh, the Brazil, UK, and South Africa strains of the virus. So when we make these multivalent versions, they're basically able to neutralize everything that we have been able to throw at it. Um, and uh, we ha have now have data uh, showing that uh, this top one uh, here neutralizes the um, South Africa virus in, in, in animals as well. So these, these compounds are very potent. Um, now, uh, uh, a nice thing about them is that they're really small, stable proteins. And unlike antibodies, which you have to make in, you know, in mammalian cells, these small proteins you can make in bacteria. And so, and, and just to show you how well they're expressed, this is whole cell lysate from cells um, expressing the, um, the uh, uh, sorry, I don't know why the band is there, but uh, expressing the, um, mini protein and that large band at the bottom, bottom is the uh, 55 residue design protein. If we just, if we heat the cells, then um, most of the proteins in E. coli are insoluble and what's left in the supernatant is the, uh, is, is the designed protein. So um, the cost of goods, the cost of making this protein on a really large scale, uh, it, it, quite small. And so we're, we're, it's exciting. This, this, these proteins these are now being, now going towards uh, 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 clinical trials. Um, the, the use would be as a, as a nasal spray, um, that as you've seen could, can, can confer uh, prophylactic and therapeutic protection. We think this really could be made on a very large scale, much larger than antibodies and could be the prototype for a whole new generation of, of drugs. You know, antibodies are, are really expensive. They're part of what's keeping the, the cost of healthcare high. And now from the computational design point of view, the challenge is uh, to improve this design pipeline so it can go from the identification of a threat to really high 
potency uh, inhibitors like this in a relatively, you know, just a few weeks, which we think should be possible because the key calculation, the key things are happening on the computer. So next I'll tell you about uh, diagnostics. Um, and so um, what I told you about just now were these small proteins that were basically just had one state, but we're, but we're also designing proteins which have multiple states. And a basic picture here is here. Um, so we have this uh, uh, system with a closed state and an open state. And the conversion from the closed state to the open state is driven by the thermodynamics, uh, the, the free energy of binding of a binding module embedded in this closed state to a target. And we've set this up so that the closed state is dark and the open state emits light because luciferase is reconstituted. So basically using this system then, we can detect um, a wide variety of compounds just by embedding different binding domains in this uh, closed state. And so what's depicted on the right is uh, is basically, we did just what you'd expect. We, in, we inserted in this cage uh, the, the binding domain for the virus that I just described to you. Um, so that's that little 55 residue protein. And here's what the experimental data look like. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, so that the sensor um, uh, by itself is dark, that's the black line. And um, when we add in, when we add spike at um, uh, right around here, um, we, uh, or, or RBDU, so you get this rapid increase in luminescence um, as the, as the, it's basically like a molecular device. It opens up and when it opens up, it uh, reconstitutes luciferase activity. Um, and this can work on, on plates or on paper, as you see below. So maybe I'll just skip to this slide. So the, the way the sensor works is um, the, uh, the free, it's, its opening is driven by the free energy of binding to the target. Now, if there's something else that competes with the target, the sensor will close. And so here we are using the sensor to detect um, antibodies which bind to the spike protein at the ACE2 binding sites. So these will be neutralizing antibodies. And um, the, uh, the results are pretty encouraging so far. I'm gonna tell you in a moment about uh, vaccines. Um, so we have these animals that have not been vaccinated. And they're the ones in C below here. Um, and uh, when you add sera from those animals to this sensor, there's no change in the luminescence. But after the animals have been immunized, there is a, um, a sizable change in uh, in luminescence, and the chain, the amount of luminescence change is correlated with the um, with the uh, uh, the tighter, the neutralizing tighter of the antibodies. So we're excited about using this to actually. It's a very quick luminescent assay people can use to detect to see how well they're protected against the virus, and in particular how well they're protected against the the the, the strains that are around in their environment. Because we can basically do this test with um, uh, with different um, with RBDs from different uh, strains. And we, um, as I mentioned before, we can extend this to uh, designing sensors, these molecular devices, uh, to detect many different types of compounds. For example, here's a troponin sensor. And, and these curves, what I'm showing in, in each panel, here we are, um, we, we've added, we've taken each of the different sensors and added just troponin protein, and only the troponin sensor gives this large increase in light. The other ones are completely silent. And that's true for each of these. So this, in this RBD case, we're adding the RBD and only the RBD sensor is responding. So, um, so we think there's a very general diagnostics platform. And the final area I'll tell you about is vaccines. Uh, so over the years, we've been developing methods for designing self-assembling nanoparticles. Uh, so here, this is an icosahedron designed from a pentamer and a trimer. And uh, so we've designed interfaces between these that direct formation of this icosahedral cage. And uh, when we make these proteins in E. coli, they assemble, assemble into these very, very homogeneous nanoparticles. Images are shown here. Um, and uh, my colleague, Neil King, at the Institute for Protein Design here at the University of Washington, has taken the uh, receptor binding domain of the spike protein and put it on the surface, fused it to the surface of one of these nanoparticles. And that's shown here with these light blue things being the RBD. And this is what the particles look like. You see they're round and then they have little RBD spikes coming off of them. And what Neil and his colleagues have found is that uh, these, um, these uh, RBD nanoparticles elicit really strong immune responses in animals. Um, they're considerably stronger than the responses against the uh, spike protein that's shown as S2P here. 
So this is the response against the, just the trimer alone and the response against uh, his, his nanoparticles. Um, and uh, that's really exciting because the current vaccines, which are already working quite well, um, just use are based on the spike trimer, whether they're mRNA or viral or, or subunit. Um, so this is these, these particles are already in clinical trials, and uh, we're excited to see how well they work in people. Okay, so that's so I've sort of introduced the concept of, of protein interface design, uh, uh, multi-state sort of um, switching design and self-assembly in the context of COVID. Now I'll give you a few examples of of, of um, work beyond COVID. Uh, so sticking on this theme of um, <clears throat> of uh, of nanoparticles, nanocages. Uh, in that case, in what I just told you about, we designed these nanocages and then we spliced, we fused on the RBD. But we reasoned we could we could unite form and function by actually building uh, nanoparticles out of out of antibodies, where the antibody would be the structural component. So, um, and antibodies have a C2 symmetry axis. So we can take an icosahedron, for example, and place an antibody on the C2 axis and uh, a designed pentamer on the five-fold axis. And if we do it right, and we, we have the arms coming out from the pentamer having the right angles and geometry, then when they interact with the constant domain of the antibody, the whole thing will generate an icosahedral cage. And that's what you see on the right, is actually we've made, prote we've designed pentamer, pentameric proteins, which when assembled with essentially any antibody will drive the, form the, the assembly of that antibody into icosahedral cages. And, and so you see a cryo EM density from these, um, uh, of these cages shown here, superimposed on the design model. And uh, Robbie Devine, who has designed these models, these um, has um, made uh, versions that, um, that uh, hold the protein um, uh, in, it hold two antibodies in different arrangements. So these dihedral ones, the antibodies are pointing in opposite directions. In the tetrahedral ones, they are coming off the uh, edges of a tetrahedron. In an octahedron, they're octahedral ones that's off the edges of a of a cube, essentially. And then the um, uh, these are the icosahedral ones I showed you just a moment ago. Um, and um, they have different numbers of comp copies of the of antibodies. So two, six, twelve, th or thirty. And so this is a very powerful way of taking basically any antibody and converting it into assemblies of different sorts, which is interesting, of course, because uh, antibodies to carry out so many different functions in, in biology and are, and are being used in a lot of ways in biotechnology. So this is just one example of many experiments that have been done show, comparing the activity of individual antibodies to antibodies in the context of a nanocage. So here we have um, the, um, here we have our, uh, our octahedron forming um, design protein mixed with an antibody against CD40 uh, on B cells. When we add these nanoparticles to B cells, we get this very strong activation. Um, but if you just add the antibody alone, there's essentially, uh, there's, there's, there's very little activity. Um, and, um, and so you can see this very large potentiation of, of, of binding. Um, and uh, so here's, here's the antibody by itself. And we've seen this now with um, death receptor activation uh, and other pathways that um, you can, and, and this isn't a new phenomenon that if receptor clustering can uh, really drive signal activation. The exciting thing here is you can now take any antibody and make it into these very homogeneous nanoparticles. Um, so on the also on the topic of self-assembly, now we can, instead of designing um, proteins that sort of generate a curved structure, we can design proteins that generate a flat structure. Um, and this is work from Ariel Ben Sasson, designing two proteins, a green protein and a magenta protein that drive formation of this um, extended hexagonal lattice. And these, it's, it's really quite beautiful. So the, this is purifying the two proteins separately, mix them to, the, mixing them together. You get this very, very extended lattice. Um, and if you superimpose uh, on the design model onto the average density from this, you can see it fits quite well. So there's, a, uh, there's the two proteins that I was indicating earlier. We've had a great collaboration with Emmanuel Drivery um, on this. And what, what his group has found is if you attach receptor binding um, domains to um, the lattice proteins, then they bind, they can actually assemble on cells. When they assemble on cells, they completely shut down endocytosis because the, the, the membrane can't deform because it's held in place by the lattice. Now coming back to sort of the idea of switches, um, this is um, 
this is getting at the problem in, in cancer therapy that you want to target just the tumor cells, but not healthy cells. But often um, tumor cells don't differ in a lot of ways from, uh, from healthy cells. So for example, if you don't have any unique marker uh, to, um, to target, then you can't really use a single antibody, for example, to target the tumor cells. But what if you have two markers that um, occur independently on, in, on many tissues of the body, but they only occur together on the tumor? Well, then we can use a, a sort of molecular switching kind of system, like I described earlier, direct one component to one marker, the other component to the other. And it's only on cells that have both that the switch will actually open and um, will expose an effector recruiting domain. And I'm going to illustrate that here more in detail with, um, uh, in this case, where we have incorporated within the closed state of the system a CAR T cell recruiting um, uh, uh, motif. And so here we have, um, as I just described, we have the two components of the switching system being directed to the two markers that together only occur on, on cancer cells. And, but here we've made it a little more complicated. We have a third marker um, to which we attach something which um, which uh, recruits, um, uh, which basically sequesters away uh, one of the components, which we call the key, away from the other, so it can, can no longer open. And so this is this implements one and two, but not three logic, because if this third marker is here, then we get this one bound, and then the cage can't open. Oops. Um, and so you can see that here. So when we have, um, sorry, I don't know why that's always coming up. Um, so when we have, uh, only when we have two of the markers, but not the third healthy cell marker, do we get T cell activation by um, the CAR T cell activation. Um, so, okay, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about transmembrane protein design. So, um, which is gonna get more at uh, materials. Um, so here we have, uh, we've designed um, helical proteins that have these central pores, and this is just a comparison of their crystal structures and design models, and you can see they come out pretty close. We have, I'm showing you two, one, two of them here, one which has a very narrow pore and the one below which has a wider pore. So if we, um, we can convert these to uh, transmembrane proteins by um, making the outer surface hydrophobic. And um, what we find is that the one with the narrower channel is a, um, is a quite selective potassium channel um, this is not related to any naturally occurring potassium channel. Um, and it's kind of exciting because there's been a lot of discussion about why potassium channels are selective for potassium. And it's very interesting that this de novo design protein um, is, is potassium selective. And, and so now there's a lot of interesting things we can do in, in terms of designing new pores with different, um, trying to really understand what the fundamentals are of, of ion channel uh, selectivity. So uh, one more experiment on this system. So if we take a residue that's at the entrance to the pore and mutate it to a cysteine, um, that doesn't affect the conductance in itself. But if we add alkylating agents, as shown here, it completely blocks the uh, pore, um, supporting the idea that the, that the current is, is flowing through the central channel. Um, and this is a cryo-EM structure of the larger channel and um, larger pore, and you can see there's there's a big pore there, and this this one actually will allow small organic dyes to um, to get through. So there's a lot of interesting things to do here now in terms of customizing the pore interior for um, uh, for for uh, for different many different applications. And then on that note, we have um, Anastasia Vorbieva really made a big leap and and worked out how to. Um, design transmembrane beta barrels. So these are transmembrane, these are beta barrels that insert into membranes. And really it was interesting from the design point of view because uh, the key turned out to be to um, really uh, very much weaken the beta sheet forming propensity of the beta strands. And uh, Anastasia's hypothesis is that if they are, um, if, they're, if the beta sheet forming propensity is too high, then you basically will get the you know beta sheet uh, beta strand mediated aggregation and amyloid formation before the thing can assemble. So this is a crystal structure comparing the design model to the um, uh, to the crystal structure, and it's very close. There is a um, the the closest protein uh, in nature is Ampe, uh, but you can see it has a, a very different shape. So this is exciting because now uh, we can take these methods and extend them to design larger and larger. Um, pores. Um, so this is, this is 10, 12 and a 12 stranded one. 
and you can see below that they have much bigger pores. Um, we have versions of these which fold and which appear to fold and um, behave very well. We don't have crystal structures yet, but these are very exciting because for applications like nanopore sequencing, we can now sort of really customize the um, design custom pores for these processes rather than for these applications, rather than, um, you know, current efforts, just reuse things which already occur in nature. Um, and uh, so then um, sort of on a few last things before I close, um, we've also developed this game called uh, Fold It, um, which enables people who know nothing about proteins to get in and, and start designing proteins from scratch. And uh, um, if you like, uh, if, if you haven't tried it already, I encourage you, it's a, it's a fun game. And where um, we, we give um, the, the latest problems we're working on to Folded players, and often they come up with really interesting solutions, which we make up make in the lab. Um, we uh, So Brian uh, Kovnik, who's been leading this up in collaboration with people really all around the world, um, has shown that the Folded player designs uh, fold up to, Folded players can design new proteins and they can design them very accurately. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to tell you about here is that we're now designing systems, we're now very interested in designing uh, rotary motors. So here we, this Alexey Corbet has designed um, a ring, like a series of different shaped rings and a series of different cake shaped axles. And he's worked out general ways of getting these rings to assemble onto the axles. Um, and uh, when he does that, um, the uh, these are EM images here. Um, uh, and uh, what happens, so, so basically the rings assemble on the axles and um, I'm not showing it here, but you can also actually distinguish different substates, different rotational substates of these systems. So we can start designing uh, rotational landscapes. And um, uh, this is just a, uh, a, 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 a higher resolution picture of one of these systems. The, the, the interesting thing here is you can either have a match between the symmetry of the ring and the symmetry of the axle, as in this case, where they're both C3, in which case you sort of have a nice deep minima or you can have a mismatch in which the landscape is much more um, uh, is has much more um, features and fewer deep uh, minima, and um, we're now exploring that on the rotational diffusion of the of the ring around the rotor. And Alex, he's gone further to design um, uh, 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 catalytic sites at the at the interface between the uh, ring and the rotor, which um, we are very interested in seeing how they will, if we, how to couple those with with the directional rotational motion. Um, and I think I might still, I'm going to talk about if, if let me let me go to um, the conclusion of this part. Um, so I think I've shown you that we understand a lot about protein folding and assembly because we can design, you know, this whole new world of proteins, and it's a really exciting time because, you know, these these things are starting to go into people as drugs, and um, there there are a lot of I think, I think de novo protein design is going to start having more impact on the world in the next few years. Um, so I have really amazing uh, co co colleagues and coworkers. So Long Jing Kao and Ryan Coventry uh, did, did computationally design those um, binders I showed you against the coronavirus. Um, and we've had really fantastic uh, collaborators for the in vivo and cell uh, culture uh, neutralization experiments. Um, Alfredo and Andy with Bianca designed the, um, the, the switchable diagnostic. The antibody, and then Neil King's group is, I, I haven't listed here, I should have, um, is doing all the, uh, has really done all the vaccine work. The antibody nanocage work is uh, <clears throat> um, being done by Robbie Devine, a graduate student in the group. Um, and, and many of the structural characterizations were done by David Beisler and Ha Deng. The self-assembling 2D lattice is worked by Ariel Ben Sasson and co collaborator Joe Watson, Emmanuel Derivery. The de novo designed membrane proteins so Chun Fu Zhu and Pei Long Lu. Um, designed the um, uh, the alpha helical transmembrane proteins and Anastasia uh, had the breakthrough on the transmembrane beta barrel. Designed protein logic for um, on the surface of, of cancer cells worked by uh, Mark and Scott and Jillian. Um, uh, folded, I mentioned, worked by Brian, Brian Kovnik. And the rotary motor is really being uh, pioneered by Alexey Corbet. And now, if I have five minutes, I can talk briefly about um, deep learning for protein design. I don't know how we're doing for time. Yes, you have at least 10 minutes. Go ahead. Okay. All right. I'll, I think I'll just need five. Um, so, um, so okay. So everything I've told you about so far was done using this physical model. Um, but we can. Um, uh, but what I want to tell you about now is designing proteins using a completely different principle. So you're probably you're familiar with the idea that if you have a, a neural network that's trained to recognize um, 
uh, say images of cats on the internet, um, that uh, you can then take that same network and get it to hallucinate images of, of new cats basically by feeding it a random image and then optimizing that image so the network really thinks it looks like a cat. And so that's the principle we've been using to design proteins, um, uh, de novo design. So the basic idea is we've been developing these um, networks for uh, taking amino acid sequences, basically predicting protein stru structure. And the way they work is they take an amino acid sequence, they predict a distance map between all pairs of residues, and then we convert it to a three-dimensional structure. So the network hallucination idea is we can instead start with a completely random sequence. And then, of course, that doesn't really correspond to any particular contact map, but we can then optimize that sequence and then just evaluate how strongly that, um, uh, you know, that con how featured that contact map is and then generate structures from it. So this is how this works. So if we start with a completely random sequence, this is a contact map, so residue by residue. So these things are actually as a distance map. So the dark colors indicate residues close to each other. So we start with a random sequence. We don't get much featured. That they, 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 They're very diffuse, these contact maps. But then as we optimize the sequence, um, structure grows in. And you can see uh, that by the end, after um, of, the, of the optimization, these sequences very strongly want to fold the different sorts of structures. And these are pictures of what these structures look like. So um, we can do this. If we start with different random number seeds, the network generates all sorts of different types of structures. And um, maybe I'll just highlight that if we take the sequences of these proteins and put them into Rosetta, Rosetta predicts this is energy versus RMSD. Rosetta predicts the lowest energy states are, in fact, the hallucinated structures, which is kind of neat. It's an orthogonal test um, because um, uh, Rosetta didn't, and this model don't know anything about each other. Um, we've made many of these proteins in the lab, and they actually fold to, um, uh, to structures with the right secondary structure by CD that are very, very stable. They don't melt. And we've solved structures now of three of these proteins. And um, uh, they are very close to um, the design models. We've done, solved two by crystallography and one by NMR in collaboration with Guy Montiglioni's group. Um, and uh, so that's kind of neat. So we can, this, the network can just um, um, uh, sort of make up, uh, hallucinate brand new proteins and they fold and they're structured. So there's another nice property that people who are kind of experts in sort of protein design methodology will appreciate. So typically, like in Rosetta, you take a, you make your new structure, you have your new backbone, and you find a sequence which is uh, really low in energy in that backbone. But the problem with that is that there are um, uh, there could be competing states which all, whose energy also gets optimized when you're uh, when you are um, optimizing the sequence for the target state. Because Rosetta only knows only sees that backbone. But this deep learning approach, when you're optimizing a sequence to have a contact map that is the same as a target contact map. This is in the sort of a fixed backbone design scenario. Then, when you, as you, um, as you, when you're maximizing the probability of that 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 sequence folds to that structure, you're implicitly minimizing the probability that it folds to any other structure. So this false minima problem is much is much um, uh, less of an issue. And the final thing I want to mention is that we can use these methods to design new functional proteins. And the basic idea is to <coughs> constrain part of, if we take a, a naturally occurring protein and we, and that's binding a target as shown here, we can constrain the parts that are um, at the binding interface um, and then allow the rest of it just to reconfigure, to just to hallucinate the rest of it, just to form a well-folded structure without specifying what the backbone is. And I'll just give you one example here. So I think we're a little short on time. So this is C3D in the complement cascade. It binds its target, the receptor, through um, through this portion down here, uh, two discontiguous uh, helical segments with a loop. So now we can say to the hallucination process, keep the green parts fixed and just make up um, the you know come up with sequences that will fold to this. With the only constraint being that they strongly fold to some structure, and that structure have the, has the green parts intact. And uh, we get uh, many different solutions here, and I'll just show you examples for a couple different proteins. So this is where we're hallucinating parts of, of insulin interacting with its receptor, and you can see different solutions here. Um, we can do this with beta sheet proteins. Take This is part of uh, B7 binding to this target CTLA4, and um, we keep this part fixed, and then we can grow different sorts of proteins around them, as shown here. And uh, this work was even on Anash Yvonne uh, Anashanka developed TR Rosetta, and with Sergey uh, developed this hallucination procedure. Uh, Sam and Tamuka did the experimental characterization of the 
de novo um, hallucinated proteins. Chris and Basil uh, worked on this sort of energy landscape um, optimization, and Doug and Sydney and Ju um, um, uh, are working on the uh, design of proteins, um, the, the constrained hallucination uh, design of, of functional proteins. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm done. I'd be happy to, uh, to take any questions. Um, and uh, let's see, how do I, um, let's see, am I here still? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for the excellent talk. Please join me in thanking Dr. Baker for his nice presentation. Uh, you already have a number of, of uh, questions. So if you could read them and answer, that'd be appreciated. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. You have to give me instructions on how to do that again. Um, yeah. So it's the there's a ask a question button at the bottom yeah. part of the screen. So you, yeah. if you click on that, you'll see the questions. I first, I think the first two ones were for the previous speaker. Okay. When All right. Um, let's see. Yeah. When you expect an immune response to your spike proteins. Yeah. So that's... <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's a very good question. So immunogenicity is a really important question. I didn't I didn't show you, but um for for the spike binding protein, we have um we've actually done experiments. Well, Brett Case at, at WashU has done experiments where the spike binding protein has been administered intranasally um for over a three week period, once every three days, um, prior to um prior to uh uh, uh infection, and there was no decrease in efficacy. So the, the protein is not uh, eliciting uh, large uh, amounts of, of anti-drug antibodies. Um, but of course, this is going to be something that's going to be very important when we go into human clinical trials to see, to, to, to test that. So the reason why they might not be very immunogenic is they're very small and very stable and very soluble. So there's not a lot uh, that would promote presentation on dendritic cells, but, um, but that really needs to be worked out more. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so keeping... Um, uh, let's see. Okay, how far are we in predicting emergent physiochemical properties of of, uh, of antibodies from, uh, of, sorry, I'm just having a little problem. Um, sorry about this. Um, um, oh, and then the, the other question was about immunogenicity of the um, uh, of the nanoparticles. In that case, we want an immune response because um, that's a vaccine in the in the RBD vaccine. Um, okay, sampling versus scoring problem. <clears throat> They're both problems, and they we go back and forth. Uh, so um, when we make the sampling method better, this sort of as in our work on structure prediction, you have to be able to sample really finely, and you have to be able to be able to accurately evaluate structures. So I would say over the last 15 years, we keep going back and forth between sampling and uh, the energy function accuracy being the biggest issues. Um, so right now, right now, um, uh, I would say uh, probably, actually, I think they're both equally important problems. Okay, so why does nature, why is nature sampled only a tiny fraction of sequence space? Well, it's because nature doesn't really care about sampling all of sequence space. Nature has just cared about function. And um, uh, and also just sequence space is so big. I mean, 10 to 130th is an enormous number. So there, I don't think there's any physical limitation preventing nature from sampling more of it. It's just, you know, it's just there wasn't enough time and uh, good solutions to the problems could be found close at hand. So there was probably, that probably cut down on exploration too. Um, Okay, is protein design a solved problem? No, <laughs> this was a very misleading talk because I showed you all these beautiful pictures of designs that work, but most designs don't work. Um, we don't really understand why they don't either don't express an E. coli or um, uh, you know or or they express and they're not soluble. Um, there's also um, there are also other problems we're working on like uh, enzyme design where we're still not able to design and uh, design uh, brand new enzymes that are more active than naturally occurring enzymes. So there's many, many outstanding problems. I think, I think what you should take my talk is that there is, um, our progress is being made, but I'd say that uh, it's still very, very far from being solved. Um, uh, yeah, so um, um, I think it's really exciting time. Deep learning is starting to have an impact on protein design. And I think there's a really interesting question about how that will, um, inter how that will uh, interplay with um, sort of physical models like Rosetta. So right now we're kind of using both. We're using the the deep learning methods to generate 
to get in the ballpark, but they don't have really high resolution. Um, and so we use Rosetta after that. Uh, but as many of you know, uh, DeepMind's made a lot of progress in that area. And so it's, I think it's going to be really exciting over the next couple of years. We're in the midst of all these kind of paradigm changes in, um, in, uh, in this field. Like, you know, we have de novo design proteins, um, you know, going into people as drugs. We have deep learning coming online. Um, and how is that going to interact with physical models? We have the possibilities of making all these new types of materials. So it's really an exciting time. Um, could you use the hallucinated approach to, to correct the Rosetta force field? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, we have, and that was actually my original hope is that we could use deep learning to actually improve the force field. Um, and actually that was my project for a while, but, um, it didn't get anywhere, but that was probably because it was me who was trying to do it. Um, what are your thoughts on AlphaFold and its implication for the field? Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, there's, I think there's, there's, there's some great new insights and I think it's going to make everything much, much more powerful. Um, so um, I think I got most of them. Yeah. If I may, I'd like to ask a, a few questions. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very impressed by the uh, the logic gate design, and uh, I was wondering if you tell us more about the the design of it. So, is it simply a matter of designing the binding interface and a flexible uh, linker so that your it, it can open in the presence of the ligand, or is, do you actually have to model both states simultaneously? Yeah, that's a good question. So here um, we were only modeling the closed state, and the basic idea is that the thermodynamics of binding of the target to the binding element would would cause it to open, but we didn't really model that state explicitly. For for other things where you know you're trying to design um, explicit switches, then you really do need to model both states, and so that's something that um, that that's something we're working on. Where like if you wanted say um, you know a walker, for example, you'd mm -hmm. want to have both states, and so we're working on systems like that. But for the um, uh, you know, thermodynamic coupling is a very powerful principle, as you know, and so th those um, that's really how those um, molecular devices work. It's just thermodynamic coupling. We have a defined closed state, and it has to open in order to bind the target. So, yeah. Okay. And I was um, also wondering for the, the very nice work that I've seen already at, at many conferences from Alexi, the, uh, the rotating, rotating yeah. uh, machine. So uh, the design of the active site is there to provide energy to make it rotate. Yeah. And do you think that the rate of that reaction will control the rate of the rotation? Well, that's the hope, obviously. <laughs> you know, um, you know. I guess it depends really on what the activation barriers are to uh, rotation. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah. So, getting coupling of chemical energy to rotation is is kind of you know is is sort of the, is the aspirational goal. Um, uh, so there should be a relationship. Although you could imagine that th there might be many futile um, mm -hmm. hydrolysis cycles before you actually get a jump. So. But there should be a correspondence. Um, okay, and maybe a final question, just out of curiosity: Is there a reason why you pick the uh, retroaldol reaction instead of some um, other? Yeah, well, let's see. You really could pick other reactions. It's I think in that case we put it there just because we've have that's the one we have the most mm -hmm. experience by doing, and basically it requires a lysine and a. We know what the requirements are, mm -hmm. so um, we we can we can kind of reuse it for lots of things. I I don't think there's any. There's no particular benefit of that over other reactions with um, where you have a relatively cheap fuel. Okay, great, thanks. I think there's a few more questions for you. Okay, let's see. In the add a question. Okay, let's see. Um, um, let's see. Okay, um, how hard is it to introduce catalytic functionality in a de novo protein? Well. It's very easy to introduce um, uh, catalytic functionality that's not, um, you know, not very high. So for this motor case, we don't want a super high turnover rate, right? Because we would like, we basically want a lousy catalyst with a turnover rate of once every, say, 10 seconds or something. Because it has to be coupled to the conformational change. So it's easy to introduce um, uh, low K catalytic, um, uh, catalytic sites, but um, to get really, really highly active um, uh, and enzymes de novo is still a challenge. I mean, that's something that we're we're working um, on. Okay, are there consumer acceptance concerns about producing therapeutics in E. coli? Um, well, there'd be concerns about uh, about endotoxin, but I, I think I think there would be I, I think less concern than make them making them in mammalian cells, and certainly the cost being far far lower, I think would be very attractive to basically you know World Health Organizations and so forth. Okay, IP. Um, 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, Rosetta, Rosetta Commons, basically, we've made all our, uh, well, basically, all the Rosetta code is free to academics, but we license it to industry. And the basic idea is that money comes in, basically pays for activities in the Rosetta community. That's sort of what it keeps going. And then we have this annual meeting, and it's great to have people Roberto come, like Roberto come in and give talks. So that's what's funding it. Um, we are, um, it's, and, and so um, I, I am very convinced that collaboration is, um, it's good. So I can, throughout my career, you know, it's like with Rosetta at home and folded and the Rosetta Commons. I think the one thing I can tell young scientists is the more you share what you do, the better it will be. So um, like I always tell people we have no secrets. I, and and it, it's like um, it's like you the one. So so sharing like being a scientist means about trying to you're trying to it's like part of it is just so natural to share your work. So I think that's like with Rosetta Commons. Sorry, I, I, another thing I say is that early, right, right, sort of after we developed Rosetta and, and, and the first people were leaving my group to go on and start their own groups, we, I think I made a very important decision that no one would ever make any money in their pocket from, from, um, from the revenue that came in. Instead, it would all go into the community. And that's really worked well. And that's, I think, really driven the growth of the community. Um, the one thing, though, is that if you do, but there's a balance. If you do want to um, uh, develop drugs, there's a sad fact about how our world works is that the companies before investors need to know that they have rights to something. So you need to, you need to patent composition, a matter of your designed, you know, cancer therapeutic, if it's ever going to be a drug. So, um, so I think the software can be very open, but um, still, if you want a sad fact is if you do want to develop a drug out of something, you probably have to patent it, but that doesn't really prevent any academic from doing anything with it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, um, Proteolytic stability. Uh, so in, uh, de novo proteins, um, these small proteins, if you put them in systemically, they'll get filtered out really fast in the kidney. Um, and they are ultimately all making the, uh, they're all ultimately made out of um, amino acids. So they all do get degraded. So I don't think there's much worry about sort of these synthetic proteins accumulating in the body. So I can go on, but I don't know how much time we have. I mean, there are a few more questions. Yeah, feel free to keep going. We have okay, uh, a bunch sure. of minutes left. Okay, so how will um, and, uh, um, unnatural amino acids, um, uh, um, I think that's what, yeah. So we are doing um, uh, quite a bit. The, the, the difficulty with unnatural amino acids is it's much harder to manufacture the proteins. Um, so everything I told you about today was the proteins are, we're making synthetic genes, putting them into bacteria, the bacteria are making the proteins. If you want to incorporate unnatural amino acids or go beyond, natural protein backbones, period, you have to synthesize things chemically. So we've been looking a lot at um, sort of closed macrocyclic systems where we can now um, use unnatural amino acids. Of, and um, we find we can actually now, uh, by using unnatural amino acids, get, get structured systems that are very, very small, just like 10 amino acids. And uh, we can systematically design them to cross, cross membranes and um, coordinate metals and other things. So I think um, there's no real problem with modeling unnatural amino acids in a program like Rosetta, because they're just atoms connected by bonds. Um, it's probably been a problem with manufacturing. But I'll say, if we coming back to deep learning, the deep learning has a much harder time with things that you don't have lots of examples of. So physical models are going to stay very important, uh, regardless of what happens with naturally occurring amino uh, sequences, um, because. Uh, it's harder going to be harder to extend the deep learning methods to unnatural systems because of the fewer training examples. Um, let's see, when comparing designs from folded or deep learning, which method generates designs that are furthest away from, you know, they, they, the thing is that once you are, um, the, the space is so big that once you get um, away from naturally occurring protein sequences, you're, you're always equally far away. So basically none of the sequences um, have any detectable blast similarity to proteins of known, uh, known sequence. Um, so um, I would say though, if we could quantify it, I would expect the folded designs to be further away from the deep learning ones. So the deep learning sequences have insignificant E values to naturally occurring proteins, but still the models are trained on naturally occurring proteins. Oh, and I, I have one, I just want to say one thing, which I thought was, which really kind of, I found kind of eerie. So. Over the last 10 years um, with de novo protein design, we have been trying to elucidate these sort of key principles of protein folding and encoding them in algorithms and then designing proteins. And we've made all these super regular idealized proteins, which look much more like each other than they 
look to naturally occurring proteins, but they don't have any of the long loops and strange features you see in naturally occurring proteins. Well, the really eerie thing is that this deep learning generative model produces proteins that look just like our <laughs> de novo design proteins. I mean, they're different, but you can't really distinguish them. They also are idealized. They have perfectly straight helix, helices, straight strands, and um, perfect loops. So somehow, when, when we train this deep network on protein structures, it kind of extracted from, from that the same sort of general principles that um, we uh, sort of, with a more traditional scientific approach, have um, kind of uh, learned in the last 10 years. But it's very different because in the sort of the expert, you know, the, what we've been doing in the lab, it's sort of all encompassed in, you know, formalized in rules for designing ideal folds and the energy function, whereas in the network, it's kind of distributed among the million parameters of the network. So, um, okay. Do we have the final geometric structure of the protein in mind when starting the protein design? Yes, we do. Um, uh, um, because you have to have the structure in mind to find a sequence whose lowest energy state is that structure. How do you decide what that backbone should be? Well, there you go. That is the crux of this whole problem. How do you decide on the backbone? And that's one of the things. And, and, and so what you really like to do is just say, well, I want this function and then have the backbone get figured out. And that's one of the things we like about this deep learning approach is you really just de de um, uh, describe the functional site and then the deep learning basically fills in the rest. Um, and then the way we go through sequence space, once you have a protein backbone, that's that's pretty straightforward. You then search through the different combinations of amino acids for the one that has the lowest energy in, in if you're using the traditional Rosetta approach. Um, OK, how does your software improve structure prediction to minimize the risk of a protein falling into alternative energy minima? Um, well, it, it's, it's, it just is a challenge. The only thing you can really do to avoid alternative minima is to search more broadly. Um, and, um, uh, and so there isn't really an answer to the local minimum problem. Um, uh, it's, it's just, a, that's a general problem with global optimization, really, whether you're doing it by, um, uh, using Rosetta or, or deep learning. Okay, regarding deep learning based methods for protein design, might the fact that the network is trained on naturally occurring sequences lead to a bias in the structure produced by the network? Well, you would think so, but like I said, the structures that come out from the network are look more like de novo design proteins that we've made in the lab than they look like naturally occurring proteins because they look sort of like idealized proteins. Um, but undoubtedly there's, there's, there's a bias because it, it, it is just trained on naturally occurring proteins. Okay, so in the interest of time, maybe I'll just ask a final philosophical question since yeah. you're here. I, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Do you think that within our lifetime, we'll be able to design from scratch any protein for any function without ever having to do directed evolution anymore? Um, well, you know, that's, those, are, those are big words. Um, <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, it has to be a function. First of all, it has to be a function that a protein can carry out, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, you know, I think predicting the future of scientific, uh, you know, technical advances, that's a much harder problem than predicting protein structure. So I, I, but I, I mean, I can say that, that, you know, over the, if you look over the last 10 years, the methods keep getting more and more powerful. And, and I think, so I think the, the answer to your question really depends on what functions you're talking about. But I think the computational methods, I think the requirement for, um, for direct devolution optimization is going to get less and less. Um, uh, um, but I can't tell you, and, and I presume that, that the, you know, it should become possible to make enzymes that catalyze really arbitrary chemical reactions very, very proficiently, but, um, but I can't give you a timeline yeah. for that. <laughs> I, I guess th there's still work to do. <laughs> there's tons of, yeah. So I think, yeah, please take my talk as really just uh, the beginning, uh, uh, not the end. You shouldn't believe people, you shouldn't believe people who show lots of pictures of cool things in their talks because they're hiding all the dirty laundry. <laughs> Okay, well, with that, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Baker again for the exciting presentation and for taking the time to answer all of those excellent questions from the audience. I'd like to thank everybody for from their participation, as well as our first speaker for their nice presentation. And uh, I remind you that we'll see you again in a month from now. And before I forget, this is one thing I've been forgetting at all the webinars. I always forget to thank the person who works behind the scenes to organize these events that you don't see. Uh, Sarah McKenna from OUP, thank you very much for uh, you know all your help with this. It's very much appreciated.